Okay. Time for a bit of music stuff. Because otherwise this is going to be really boring, but a bit more quiet. That should be good. Okay, let's program stuff. So first... Um, come on. Oh yeah, so um, if, you uh, if you're if you interested in like the actual source code and stuff, uh, you can do exclamation mark NES NES toolchain in chat and you will get a link to the GitLab page, which should be publicly available. Better basic info to read me. And let's push that. Okay. The first commit of the project. Well, the first actual commit aside from the auto generated README. M.g4. Or honestly, I think I want to call the grammars the 502. Should be better. Hope that's a legal name. Probably not. It is not. Okay, let's call out ASM instead. Yeah, most of this should work for uh, E64, I guess. Though obviously, like, there's a lot of platform dependent stuff going on there. So. Yeah. Like all 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 the video interfacing code and all of that would be like heavily platform dependent, but the assembler in general should work uh, independently. First, we need a file rule, and I'm gonna cheat a little bit because this is not the first. Um grammar for assembly that, that I have written. I did one for for a GBA project. It's by far not a complete one. But it does have some good pointers to like where to start. Uh, I think it, it's it, it turned out quite okay. Quite well for like I think so. I'm going to start with that. So, I'm going to make like an sample S file because this is the point where we have to think about like how do I how do I want an assembly file to look. For this and since I said I'm doing uh, all custom stuff custom assembler not trying to be compatible with anything I can completely choose who this is supposed to be working so that's awesome so let's open up um, an overview over um, some web pages on the other tab. 502 assembly stuff. I mean, in general, um, so. What's most important is, like, we need labels. 
Um, to do stuff, we need some sort of data thing that we can give like numbers to. And we need to be able to do functions that can have code. So like, um, put some actual D502 functions there, like, um, uh, push a, push the A register, um, then let's do, uh, TXA, ADC, Y, That'd work. I'm not even sure. Right now, I'm not even sure if I can add two registers. <laughs> I don't think I can. Um, whatever, let's just, um, stand with, uh, with, uh, for now. Uh, I can add some immediate, so, um, we have to think about how we want to encode our in immediate. Oh, by the way, that's an address. Uh, that's an immediate. Maybe. I don't know. Um, that's what the page that I'm looking at uses and what a lot of people use, but honestly, I don't like it and I'm free to change it. So, maybe we'll do something completely different. Um, I also wanted to look at the website of NES Dev. Because that's a really good resource for everything NES related. And since the NES is the target, uh, the main target architecture, um, that's a good resource to use for, for this. So, um, commonly, um, for numbers, they use the dollar prefix for hex numbers. So I'm definitely uh, want to support like writing the more conventional OX thing because that's just what people do these days. So I really want to stay, want to use that. Um, I think the hash prefix for for immediates is fine. So, I guess we'll do that. Yeah, but all of that we'll have to see. In. And let's do a PLA and an RTS. RTS, that's some kind of function. Oh yeah, um, also I want to do uh, what we what's definitely important is like calling other functions. So and for this is um, that's another point that I definitely want to do like right now. Right away is um, visibility of labels because this other function obviously isn't in this file. So let's assume we have a different assembly file that has the other function. So. What we're gonna do there is say declare that other label as an external, so that way the assembler knows um, that this is coming from a different file, so it doesn't need to care about that and needs to put like the information in the object file for the linker to then link to that other file. Um, and I also want to make the function label available to the outside. 
So for that, I'm going to use global function. Um, something like that. Uh, many assembly uh, assemblers that I've seen, they they like mix those two, and I don't like that. Because then if you have like a typo and most labels like it, it like just turns your typoed global function into an extern function. And this way is like with extern, there there must there must not be an other fu an, a function named or a label named other in this file. And with global, there must be a label named function in the file. I think this is like more secure, so I prefer this. Yeah, for data, I think we're just gonna have, uh, we are only going to have one byte data, maybe two byte data. Um, I could do like, because this is an 8-bit processor, so I'm not sure if I should do like a dot word, though the word technically would be five, maybe something like address. Because the, the only data bigger than a byte usually is like, like multibyte data is like the only native data thing that is bigger than one byte is an address. You could have data for like one byte address for like two bytes, so that would be 8,000, I guess. And what we can, what I also want to do is like um, for multiple, for multibyte data, I can, I, you just like, uh, you can do like commas. So that would be three bytes in succession, uh, a one, a two, and a three. So I think that's good. Um, yeah, and also, um, Another thing we need is sections. Uh, sections are really common in like assembly stuff and like your stuff. They like to, to structure the data out so that you have you usually have a text section that's for executable code. Um, um, yeah, and then you have a uh, like a data section for like your constants or something uh, or like an uh, read-only data for constants and data for global variables and then the linker puts like similar stuff together usually so you have all the text in like one big blob and then you have all the read-only data in one big blob uh, for the executable which is just way nicer um, it allows you to have like similar stuff together in the end, but while writing code, we have like logically stuff that logically become belongs together in one place. I'm gonna call this thing adra uh, level, and uh, let's call this um, pointer. Just some random names I'm giving them, and I'm going to say that. Um, This point, uh, the pointer is uh, read-only data. So this is meaning uh, this is supposed to live in ROM. Uh, this variable label. This is a global variable. So. Um, Let's say it's global variable, so that would use the same uh, global.global directive. 
And this is data, so this lives in RAM. And I want like a special, I think I want um, special uh, ZP data for zero page data. Because um, the zero page in the 6502 uh, refers to the first 256 bytes of your address space. And any access to the zero page is faster than access to the rest of the memory. And so I want a extra section of data that it has to go into the zero page, I guess. So this is by far not all that we need, I think, but it's a good start. So let's do this. Let's just start writing down stuff. So, first thing I want to start with is some tokens. Oh yeah, so um, about the grammar. This has to be a semicolon. About the grammar. Um, I'm using Antler, Antler 4, for writing my gen uh, my grammar and generating a lexer and parser. I, I, I love Antler. Um, it's amazing and it, it works very well. It has support for a lot of different programming languages, though um, some of their runtimes are not as good as others. Let's say it that way. But yeah, um, I'm also pretty familiar with it, so that's what I'm going to use. So, yeah. So, we're gonna use that for all our parsing stuff. And then build on top of that. So, first is white spaces. White spaces separate other tokens, but I don't actually care about like amounts of white spaces, so... Indentation is optional. So like if I, I if I wrote my code like this, so like put this here and then if I add some extra thing here, a tab and there, this would be completely legal code. So um, I wouldn't recommend you writing something like that, but it it should assemble just fine. Is what I'm thinking. Oh yeah, also another thing um, that we should definitely do um, as I'm looking at labels, uh, labels starting with, the, with a dot that would be um, local to this function. So uh, this was, would result in an actual label called uh, function.label. Um, so that way, if you have like loops in in a function, you don't al always have to come up with a new unique name for every single loop. It just has to be unique within that function. Um, you you, you should you could probably be able to make it that they don't even have to be unique within the function, and then it just refers to the most previous one or whatever. But if in this case, I think being unique in the function is better because that way you can't accidentally refer to the wrong label. But yeah, so that just as a side note. Also, what we should probably do is um, adding like a double slash or something uh, for comments so that you can like write comments into your code, so that would be good. Okay, um, white spaces. 
White space is space or tab. I guess Antler knows. Um, you know backslash s. Um, well, let's just use this to test a few things. Can I just? No, it does not. Or is it W? No, W is word character. It doesn't know these uh, more advanced game sequences. It only knows characters. So I have to do that myself. So this wouldn't match like Unicode, white spaces, stuff, but that's fine for now. And we don't actually care about white spaces, so skip them. Um, they have to be there, like in, in between two, two operands of an instruction, there has to be white space, and that's also what this does. Otherwise, they would become one token. But the actual white, white space token itself, we don't care. There's one white space or a billion doesn't matter, as long as there's something there separating the, the two other tokens. And same goes for New Lime. Um, supposed to be an R. And this weird syntax that I wrote here, this just ensures that we catch all types of new lines. So if it's just a, a carriage return, we match that first part. Um, if it's carriage return new line, then we match this entire thing. And if it's only a new line, then we, we it matches this part. And or like also the second part because the R is optional in this and so that way uh average return works, new line works, and average return line feed. All three variations of this work, which is awesome. And exactly what we want. And then I wanted to end. And for a comment, what we're going to do is two slashes followed by any character for any amount and a new line. Yep, and I th think this should work. Yes. So, uh, for demonstration, so if I do this, this is an error, but if I do like text and then a new line, it's okay. This still throws an arrow if there's an end of file, so let's do this, I guess. Yeah. Just in case. This is good. Well, good start so far. We have nothing. Which sounds bad, but if you look that we actually did write a comment. Yeah, good. So let's actually copy this thing that we wrote and let's just 
scoured all those arrows that errors that we have down there and make them all go away by ending our our grammar. So for one a file consists of multiple lines. I guess an empty file is legal too. And a line can be one of many, many things. Um, one would be a directive. 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 Like extern or global. The extern directive is the like all the directives would start with a dot. I guess I could make that by putting the dot up here. And by by putting the quotation marks around the dot I um I think I think that makes sure that it doesn't come a while or like this down here. I could put the dot up here, but I don't think I want to do that. Also because that would result in that being two tokens and I want it to be a single token. Extern and then some kind of label. Whatever label is. Let's leave Or let's not call this label, let's call this identifier. Identifier. Fire. Okay, now we're good. And let's do the same for global. So Antler does allow us to inline tokens with um, the parser rules. So the the upcase rules um, that are highlighted in in purple here, uh, those are Lexer rules. They just take the Lexer just only takes a string of characters and splits it up in like basically into words. Like, uh, it's just low level. It's very linear, very simple, can't, can't do a lot of logic. And if there's, if there's multiple, if a string could fit multiple lexer rules, uh, it just takes the first. So, yeah. So the lexer itself is pretty stupid, but it breaks down the... The amount of input that we put into the, the parser. Is the parser we could have the parser run on the just the text file, basically making making every every character its own token. But that just increases the the amount of data that the parser has process. So uh, we use Alexa to basically group together certain characters that build a token and then just have the parser work on the tokens. Uh, the parser is smart. Uh, it can do way more complex stuff. Um, uh, Antler grammars are even able, uh, like the Antler parser is even able to parse some context sensitive grammars. Um, if you don't know what that is, doesn't matter. But yeah, so basically that's the the important different. Uh, so this upper, these uppercase things are lexer rules. They are just character strings, and the lowercase rules 
here. Those are parser rules, and they are basically the they are the rules that actually make up basically our language, our grammar. And this dot x turn defines an like an implicit token. But uh, what I like to do is I I like to do this um, explicitly. Um, it structures uh, my fi the file a bit more, and it also helps with um, detecting conflicts between between different lexer lexer rules. Because as I said, if uh, if they overlap, if one character string could match multiple lexer tokens, it's just gonna choose any of them. Um, in Antler, it's always the first one in order of how they are in the grammar file here, which we can actually use to our advantage. So you, you can have like uh, this very specific rule where you need exactly the string dot global, and later on we can have a rule like this. Which includes like would include that, but it's bigger. Also, we, we could just have a dot star rule down here, basically as a catch all rule. Like, hey, this is some input that was not matched by any other rule. And then Allah would make sure of that that since that's a catch all, all of the above would also match that, but it's it's choosing the one above because that's first in order. Okay, that was a lot of talking. So we have the these external and global. We need an ad identifier. And for that I want to make a, a word rule. Um, I could just do something like this, and then say the identifier is a word. Sure what that would match. Yeah, that would just match the space. So I would have to put it after the white space. I would match. Oh, whatever. I don't know. I don't care. Um, I don't like doing that. So I like to um, be more specific about what characters are allowed in a word. And for now, it's going to be these. And I'm going to put a plus on there. So a word is multiple character out of the choice of an uppercase A to an uppercase C, lowercase A to lowercase Z, 0 through 9, a dot underscore or a dash. So that's a word. And identifiers are just those words. A single word. Context. And we can now see down here it's probably a bit hard to read, and I sadly don't know how to make this any larger for uh, for it to be more visible on on stream. But it's parsing the first three lines correctly now. So the first line is a directive. It is an extern directive, consisting of the extern lexer lexer token extern and the identifier word other and then the same for global function and global variable and down here i have this nice uh, tree view that works for me and yeah 
Actually, I think yeah. This is a zoom slider. Hey, I can I can make it bigger. Awesome. And now I open different windows that I don't care about. Where does that keep opening up? Oh, whatever. Okay, now it's very big, so now you should be able to read it. But yeah, it's parsing that just fine. Awesome. Okay, now we only have very little code up here, but that doesn't matter. We don't need that much. So the next arrow we have is line 5 with the dot section. And you can see it parses or it lexes a section as a word. Uh, we actually want this not to be a word, we want this to be a special token section. And now it is a section token. But it still gets an error because it, the, the parser doesn't actually know what to do with it. So for that we're going to define a, sec a new section parser rule using the section lexer rule and a section name. And that's also a director, so we're going to add it to 4 up here. And now we just need to define a section name. So I'm there's a few section names that we said we want to have. Uh, one is text. Actually, I think we should make uh, should do dot text dot ro data and so on, because that's what usually is well, what these are. Um, uh, which is good one for like consistency with existing systems, which I don't necessarily be necessarily want to. Uh, actively go for, but for stuff like this where it doesn't matter, um, I think it's good to have because also um, these these are reserved terms, so you cannot name anything, uh, any variable dot text, which is a result of this simple way of parsing this, because since we have this Text lexer rule now. Um, the string dot text will never ever match a word, and since an identifier is only a word, um, no identifier can ever be dot text. We could go around that by saying, okay, the identifier is word or dot text. This would make dot text a valid identifier, but we don't actually want that. Uh, the section names should only ever be for the purpose, or only ever be used for the purpose of section names. Okay, so next one is data. RO data. And DP data. That's the four that we said we want to have in this. Also, yeah, um, if anyone ever has any questions about what I'm writing, why I'm doing anything the way I'm doing it, please do ask away. Um, usually I can explain pretty well what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And if I can't, then, and if I'm doing stupid stuff, then please tell me so too, because I'm ready to learn. After all, this is the entire reason why we're doing this, to learn to learn stuff. But yeah, so we define those for Lexa rules, and 
gonna say that a, a section name is either text thing or data arrow data or zero page data. So I'm not sure if I want to leave it at that. So we could either leave it at this or I'll just put an alternative right below here. What we could do is do a text section. Say a section is either a text section or a data section or and so on. And then down here we say, okay, a text section is section text and so on. Then the same for data and our data and so on. But I don't actually think that um, I want that. One is that that makes it like really cumbersome to to add new section names. Also, if maybe later on I wanna like support arbit, uh, may, uh, maybe want to support arbitrary section names. Um, maybe I actually should do that. Just make section name an identifier. I probably should do that. Which would undo that. Maybe I should do that. Could make section name an identifier, which would allow you to make a section of any name. And this grammar is for the assembler, and the assembler doesn't really care about what you name your sections. And it might be useful to to, to do that. I don't know. I think for now I'll leave it at this. Actually, no. I decided I'm going to go with arbitrary section names. Because why not? Also, what we can do is we say that within the this section rule, I want to refer to this identifier by the by the name name. Uh, this comes in later when we write our actual actual uh, when we actually um, handle the finished parse data. Because the assembler is only going to pass on this section name directly into the output file anyways. Like it will will put together everything with the same section name and then write that out and put the section name as is into the header. But there's no real benefit to parsing it and uh, lexing and parsing it in some special way, so I'm not actually gonna do that. Okay, so we have the sections parsed. Next error on the list is this variable. As you can see with like this, um, this is very much just developing as I go along. So yeah, as I said, feel free to, to, to throw in ideas in, in chat of your own uh, if you'd like to contribute or if you think that I'm doing stupid things because I can guarantee you I'm going to do stupid things a lot during this project. Okay, but well, let's go on to a new type of line. This is not a directive. This is also not really an instruction, so it's gonna get its own its own thing. A label. And a label is an a 
then to fire, followed by a colon. And for this, I'm also going to make a new texture rule. Colon. That's only matching a colon. And we're on to the dot data. Okay. So it's currently complaining that it has a missing colon because it thinks the dot data is a word and tries to match it as a label. But this is not a label. But data is another directive that we have up here. And going to be interesting. Is if I make a token dot data now we're going to have a conflict between this dot data token and the date dot data identifier that we want to have for sections. Could rename this to byte. I wanna leave it at data. What I'm going to do is going to define data as dot data and what we can do um, is that's why I have this like identifier this extra uh, identifier parser rule because uh, the, the problem is now if I do this uh, data and uh, let's just say um, identifier. This section is not going to work anymore because data now is a data which is not a not a word and it, it expects a word and I can say that data is not only an indicator for this data directive it also is a valid identifier. These others, though, those aren't. If we wanted to, we could add, add them. But I don't think I want to. And with data, I do. Like a special case, kind of. Not sure if this is a good way to handle it, but it's the way that I do handle it. And now we need the same for dot address. Address, address, identifier. Oh right, the identifier part. Um, let's do that first. Because uh, 0x12 is... It's a number, but it also matches our, our current uh, Inter interpretation of a word because words are allowed to include digits. So what we're we going to do next is going to make a new number rule which is um, it's potentially negative and it might have a 0x prefix or instead of the 0x it might have a hash prefix a dollar prefix. sorry because uh, a lot of 6502 code uses this dollar prefix. I don't like it, but 
I do want to support it so that if, if, if you copy paste code from somewhere, it still works. I guess. I don't know. I might re uh, remove that in the future. So those are the prefixes, and then we have a bunch of digits. And digits could be 0 to 9, or the letters A through F, because a hexadecimal, and then we allow um, that a number can have more than just one digit. And we're done. So that's a number. And numbers also aren't valid identifiers. Uh, the word word rule. I should probably adjust this. To where I say that the first character in a word must not be a digit. I think that's a good thing. So now the, the first character uh, has to be like a letter or a dot or an underscore. I also don't want to throw a dash in there. And then all those. And then it can be zero or more additional characters, which also are letters, but they also can be uh, digits or dot underscore or the dash. I think this is good. Okay. So now we have the label variable. And then it breaks down here because as a dot data, but it can't match this data directive anymore because that says it wants an identifier, but it actually wants a number. And everything's fixed again. So, back to that address thing. Address is also a directive. Address falls the same scheme of being an address and I think at this point I need a parser rule number that matches numbers because I'm going to run into problems with what I'm doing now otherwise Or rather, I think what I'm going to do is want to split this. This address can be do think, uh, two things. You can provide an absolute address, like that x8000 there, but I also want you to be able to something like I want to put the address of the function with name function here, or the address of the array. That we define down here. And I think I'm actually going to parse this as two different things. So an address directive could be either uh, an address, I guess, number I'm bad with things. Or you could have an address. Oh. Yeah, probably not good. Definitely not good names. 
But other than that, I think this is a good way to do it. So this would be address and then a number. And then address label would be address identifier. And I should probably name this fire, not confuse the terms. So that we are consistent with how we use the terms identifier and label. A label is always like, an identifier is a name and a label is always like the reference, like the, the thing with the colon and the code. The introduction of an identifier, you could say, it's the declaration of an identifier. And we need the address token. And we're pretty far already. Line 16 out of 28 is the next error. And this is this multi-byte multi data thing that I had, uh, that I wanted to be able to make. And that we're just going to add here. And what we're going to do is data consists of data and a number. But after that, there can be a comma and another number. And that zero to infinite amount of times. And now if I go here and clear that token, this also matches. And if we look at the parse tree, Then we have here uh, a directive, uh, a data directive with the numbers 1, 2, and 3, which is exactly what we want. And after that, uh, the data direct directive is finished and we have a new section directive in here. So th this is parsed correctly again. So, now we're at actual source code. And this is where we're going to add all the, every single opcode that the 6502 supports to this grammar. The NES does not support the decimal mode. I still want to add uh, those Thing, uh, those uh, the decimal, decimal mode related instruction to the grammar so that I then can generate proper error messages. Or maybe just assemble them in, in case you want to target a different 6502 a processor based system that does support the decimal mode. Wouldn't be too difficult either. And just look up the actual code. For, for those instructions. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna add all of that, all of those. So, put them here. And it sounds a lot, but it's actually not. <laughs> because there's like, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. What him times for there is. There's like less than 50. Um, I'm looking right now, it's like 48 different instructions that the CPU has, which is like nothing, especially to compare to like um, x86, your 
current computer is probably running, or also our most 48, that is not a lot. And 48 including um, push the A register, push uh, the processor register as separate ones, or increment A, increment X, and increment Y, they are three separate. And if you group those together, like these, also like the, the set bit and clear bit functions for, for, the, for the status bits, or flags, if you group them together, I think it's less than 20. Um, like, I guess, meta instructions. Uh, that you have, and yeah, so. Okay, but enough of that. That's uh, tokens for these. And all of these would also be reserved identifiers, so you're not allowed to name a label and, for example, because and is an instruction, and that does make sense, so I'm not going to add a fix for that. And what I want to do is... I want to also allow you to either write them uppercase or lowercase, uh, however you like that. But it has to be like, and uh, all uppercase or all lowercase, so no mixed case, so ADC would not be a, va uh, a valid instruction, or even more crazy, like stuff like that. That's definitely not a valid instruction. So I just write them down alphabetically, because that's how they're sorted in... And the website that I have open as a cheat sheet. Because I think I could come up of, up with all of them off of the top of my head by now. As I spend quite a lot of time with them. But that would take way too long. And I also don't want to forget any, so I'm going to copy all of that. So ASL remixing shift left. So add with carry, log logical and, oh, bitwise and actually, uh, arithmetic shift left. Yeah. Then no arithmetic right shift? Oh yeah. Welcome to the uh, 6502. Okay, uh, branch carry clear. You see. Branch carry set. Uh, branch equal. Um, I also may, m m might add like additional um, ins uh, instructions for branches that are like um, equivalent. Because branch equal, I think, is a branch zero, if I remember correctly. Let me check. Yeah, branch instructions. Um, right, so branch equal of uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't say here specifically, but uh, equal usually, branch equal use it usually if is um, a branch if zero, if the zero flag is set, then um, you do comparison by subtraction. So two, two numbers are equal if the difference is zero. Branch equal is a branch zero, so I might add a branch, a branch uh, basically a BZ or something. I don't know. Branch zero instruction that would then be parsed as if it was a branch equal. Um, just for convenience sake, but I'm, if I do so, I'm gonna do so at a later point. So, a bit test. Uh, branch minus. Then we have branch not equal. Uh, a branch plus. And next we have the break. We're going to interrupt. We have branch overflow clear. Then a branch overflow set. And... Oop. That should be an S. Have a clear carry. Have clear decimal. Um, the interrupt. Uh, the fl uh, interrupt flag is for enabling and disabling uh, interrupts um, yeah here's what exactly I'm not that it's been a while since I last did this there's two types of interrupt there's like normal uh, software interrupt thingy and there's the NMI, the non-maskable interrupt, and I'm not, I'm not sure which one you enable and disable with that flag. Um, yeah, overflow. Also, the the clear carry and set carry instructions are very important processor. Because um, there, there only is an uh, addition and subtraction with overflow, uh, with carry in. So there is only an add with carry. There is no add without a carry. So if you want to add without carry, you have to explicit, exp 
explicitly clear the the carry flag for doing the addition. Okay, uh, with this music, so. Play some OC remix, because that's good music. Yeah, volume should be okay. I think it can be a bit louder. At the at my OBS. So I think this should still be fine. And honestly, what I what I'm writing right now is pretty boring. We have the compare instruction. Uh and then we have uh, CPX is compare with register X. And then the same we have CPY. Fun fact, um, I'm not sure if it's fixed by now. It's been a while since I tried that. But in the processor definition of that Gitra has about the 6502, uh, the compare instructions are messed up. So there, there is a, an inverted comparison. So there is a uh, a less than where there should be a greater than. So all your conditions are the wrong way around. And also, it always updates the condition flags based uh, on the A register, even for the compare X and compare Y functions. So, yeah. Um, the, if you try to decomp uh, decompile X86, uh, X, blah, not X86, it's 6502 code with Gedra. It will uh, break and be completely wrong. But again, it's been a while since I tried that. Okay, those were the decrement. So now XOR. Uh, and increment. And then we also again have an, an increment for X. And X. And then increment y. And we have jump. Jumps are important, and I keep writing jump with a U, which well, technically isn't wrong, but that's not how the mnemonic is written. And we're halfway done. Next one is JSR, which is jump safe return address, also known as call in... Uh, uh, Sometimes I, I also see, have seen people call it a jump subroutine, which might also be correct. Don't actually know which one is. Um, 
I refer to it as jump safe return address because that is exactly what it does. And well, I've uh, I've seen some code for the NES with some very very interesting uh, subroutines that did very very weird things to that return address so yeah so load a register value oh the most important up uh, instruction of them all the one uh, one instruction to rule them all Stop. No operation. So we have an OR instruction. Instruction. That's called RA. There is no RX or RY, but it's still called RA. Probably because every mnemonic has to be three digit, uh, three characters, because reasons. Parcels by far weren't as powerful back in the day, so they just put the A in there. Push A. Uh, push X. Oh no, right, there's no push X. Only push A and PHP. PHP is, in fact, a valid 6502 instruction. It's short for push process state, and it pushes a byte onto the memory that contains all the processor status flags, like the zero flag, the uh, the negative flag, the carry flag, the overflow flag, flag, and so on. And then, according to the pushes, we also have pulls. And we have a rotate left. A rotate right. RTI, uh, return from interrupt. Um, yeah. It's the return statement for an interrupt routine other than a normal subroutine which uses RTS. This is probably rather boring to watch right now. Uh, believe me, it is also boring to write, but we're almost done. Uh, just did our subtract with carry function. And again, there is no subtract with our carry, so. And those SE instructions, those are the the, uh, the set flag instructions. So set carry flag, set a decimal flag, uh, set interrupt. And there's actually no set overflow currently. And now we have door A, or 
general, the core instructions, the reverse of the load instructions that we had earlier, for storing data from a register into your memory address. And there is, again, one for each of the three register that the 6502 has. And now everything that is left is the transfer. Uh, transfer is a register to register copy, so DAX moves the contents of the A register into the Y register. And yeah, same for TAY, but Y register and whatever. TAY SX. I think the S is also is. are you? Right, the stack pointer. I remember. So the 6502 does have a 256 byte stack um, that is used for function calls and you can also push and pull stuff, but yeah, 200 bytes is not a lot. And then the reverse, so TXA. YA. Or, well, in alphabetical order, TSX. XS. First. S. And then YA YA and we're done. We should be done. So let's see. All of those should be forty eight. Fifty five line breaks. Where am I am I stupid? And I count. Very confused how we got to. How did we did I mark too much? Apparently, I'm stupid. But whatever. This BC and ASL EBCS BQ bit I B and E BL BRK EBS CLC 
CLV, CLI, CLV, CMP, XCPY, DEC, DEX, Y, your ink in X and Y, jump, JSR, LDA, LDX, LDY, and even missing some. There has been uh, SDR, SR. Logical shift right. Oh, good that I double checked them. LDY, LSR, NOP, RA, A, push P, OA, hold P. Rotate left, rotate right. RTI, RTS, SCC, D, SCI, A, X, Y, T, K, Y, A, X, T, Y, T, S, X, A, X, S, T, Y, A. Apparently I'm just stupid for math right now, so yeah, I'm just too stupid to math right now. Um, yeah, this is correct. Yeah, 56 now is exactly the amount that we need. And everything else I've said today was me being not mathy. But that was a lot. So... I think I'll stop now because it's getting late and I'm getting hungry. Um, I'll upload all of the VODs of the, uh, the project programming sessions for this toolchain to YouTube. And I will also only work on it on stream, so expect more streams of this. And if you if you're really interested in this and missed a stream, then wait maybe a day or two and it should be on YouTube where you can check it out. So yeah, and also if you liked it, leave a follow so you don't miss when we go back and continue writing the this grammar including actually implementing parser rules for these uh, for all the instructions and also adding the rules for parsing all the different addressing modes and the 6502 is a simple processor but it still has a lot of different addressing modes so with that i'll say you next time